Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all here in the room, but also a warm welcome everybody who's watching us at home at, uh, from the live stream. My name is Jürgen Tronafong and I'm the moderator tonight. And tonight we will be discussing in these times of heated debates about identity politics, the book that was written by our, give, by our guest, Keenan Malik. A warm welcome to Keenan. Thank you so much for being here. It's very good being back. Uh, we, we, we had you a while ago, pre-COVID, and like in the meanwhile, you haven't been here, right? No. We're going to talk about your book, because your book, Not So Black and White, A History of Race, um, From White Supremacy to Identity Politics, and your book provides an, an, an analysis of the concept of race. What is that? And the question is, can we strive for anti-racist politics based on solidarity and influenced by the notion of class? And today, we're not going to only talk, you're going to have a lecture, well, which introduces us to your book. And uh, we all will talk in this evening about the relevance of your book in connection to the political Dutch debate and the future of, for example, the left-wing movement. So again, very happy to have you here. And I would say the floor is absolutely yours for your lecture. Thank you. We could give him another hand, right? <laughs> Thank you. So, it is a real pleasure to be back here. Um, this will be about four or five years since I was last here. So um, it's uh, my thanks to, to De Bali and all who've organised it. Um, and my thanks to you as well. Um, I want to begin with a, with a quote from Franz Fanon. Um, the Negro is not any more than the white man. That's from his 1952 book, Black Skins, White Masks. And he was making an argument about the illusory character of racial categorization. And yet, more than 70 years after he wrote those words, they still feel unsettling. The Negro is not any more than the white man. As if they're a, a challenge, not just to racialization, but to our identity, our very being. And that they should feel so um, unsettling. Exposes, I think, the deeply conflicted relationship we still possess with race. We live in an age in which, in most societies, there is a moral abhorrence of racism, albeit that in most, bigotry and discrimination still disfigures the, the lives of many. We also live in an age which is saturated with identitarian thinking, with the placing of people into racial and ethnic boxes. And the more we despise racial thinking, the more we seem to cling to it. And that's the paradox I want to address um, tonight. And to do so, I want to retell the history, both of the idea of race and of the struggles to confront racism and to transcend racial categorization, and how those two histories intersect. For it is in the intersection of those two histories that we, I think we begin to understand how we've got to where we are um, and the nature of contemporary politics. I want to begin with the idea that race is a modern concept. That's not to say prejudices or the categorization of human groups were not deeply rooted in the pre-modern world. On the contrary, they were integral to the pre-modern consciousness. But paradoxically, that's why such prejudices were a long way from racial ideas in the modern sense. Only in a world in which the principles of social equality and a common humanity have become accepted can ideas of racial inequality and difference acquire real meaning. And that was the world that slowly was coming into being in 18th century Europe particularly through the Enlightenment. Now, there's perhaps no period of history that's been more debated and contested than the Enlightenment. For some, it's the foundation of modern ideas of liberty and equality. For others, the source of racism and bigotry. It was not, however, a singular blob 
with a single set of views and ideals. The Enlightenment was cut through with conflicts and contradictions. It was an age in which ideas about equality and a common humanity became widely accepted. It was also an age of slavery and colonialism. Many Enlightenment philosophers combined a defence of liberty and equality with racist attitudes and even an acceptance of slavery. And what we see here are the beginnings of a contradiction that would shape the modern world. A contradiction between an abstract belief in equality and the reality of a deeply unequal world. And race came to be a way of making sense of that contradiction. Emerging capitalist societies had destroyed many old divisions, but had created new ruptures, not simply between Europeans and non-European peoples, but also fault lines of class and rank within European societies themselves. Divisions that seemed as permanent as those of the old. These divisions would have seemed unremarkable in the pre-modern world, but in societies that define themselves now by their attachment to equality and liberty, these inequalities and injustices posed fundamental problems. Race became a means to bridge that contradiction by insisting that certain peoples were by nature unequal and therefore not deserving of liberty and equality. There's a common assumption that racism emerges when members of one race begin discriminating against members of another, that racism is what developed when races collide. Well, I want to turn that argument on its head. Race did not give birth to racism. Racism gave birth to race. The ancestors of today's African Americans were not enslaved because they were black. They became classified as a distinct and inferior race, as a means of justifying their enslavement. And at the same time, mainstream, at the same time as mainstream enlightened thinkers were, such as Locke or Hume or Voltaire, who married a belief in equality and universality with support for racism and colonialism, at the same time that they were making those arguments, they were also challenged by more radical, lesser-known figures, Diderot, Dolbach, Spinoza, and so on, who were intransigently opposed to racism, slavery, colonialism. A good example in the 19th century of the different responses of liberals and radicals to, um, uh, to the questions of race and colonialism came with the so-called Indian Mutiny of 1857, um, which was in fact an early nationalist insurrection in India. Um, John Stuart Mill, you know, the lodestone of Victorian liberalism, the, the, the key figure um, in the liberal tradition, was also a supporter of colonialism. He worked for the East India Company, which at that time governed India. After the Indian Mutiny, he wrote a long memorandum for Parliament, for British Parliament, defending British rule by listing the advances he believed that it had brought to India. Working class radicals were very unimpressed. A series of editorials in the People's Paper, which was the voice of the radical Chartist movement in, in England, insisted that the struggle in India was no different to the struggles for freedoms by European peoples. Many Britons, he pointed out, had supported Poles in their struggle against Russia and Hungarians in their conflict with Austria. They should equally, it insisted, support the struggles of Indians against Britain. For liberal imperialists, liberal universalists, the so-called backwardness of non-European peoples validated colonialism. For radicals, liberty and equality 
were not uh, the prerogative of, uh, the privilege of the civilised few, but the prerogative of all. And a century and a half later, we're still having those similar debates. But it's important to recognise that distinction between two different forms of universalism, because we often talk about universalism and have a debate, is it good, is it bad, without recognising that it comes in more than one form. The political success of the liberal tradition ensured that racial views became dominant in the 19th century. The concept of the racial type was of a group of people linked by a set of fundamental characteristics and differing from other races by virtue of those attributes, not just mental and physical traits, but also social needs, aspirations and value. One's being, one's identity, determined one's moral and social place in the world. And here, long before the phrase was coined, was the first politics of identity. We think of politics of identity as something modern, something um, uh, contemporary, something left-wing. What I'm suggesting is that it's old, it emerged in the late 18th, early 19th centuries, and it emerged out of the reactionary right. And today also, we think about race in terms of skin colour or continent of origin, black, white, Asian, and so on. But in the 19th century, the concept of race was very different. Race was an issue not simply of skin colour, but primarily of social differences. And it may be difficult to comprehend now, but for 19th century thinkers, the working class was as racially distinct, as anthropologically distinct from the middle class as blacks are from whites in the, in the minds of many today. Sociologists developed the argument that class divisions were really race divisions. Lester Ward, who was the first president of the American Sociological Association, a key figure in the development of sociology in America. He argued, for instance, that the genesis of society has been through the struggle of races. And he believed that the conquering race looks down with contempt upon the conquered race and compels it to, work, to serve it in various ways. And that the ward was the origins of social class. Not just the working class, but many populations now seen as white would certainly not viewed that in the 19th century. The Irish, Jews, Slavs, Southern Europeans were all seen as distinct races and often as non-white. Race in the contemporary sense and whiteness as we understand it emerges only in the early decades of the 20th century, propelled by two major developments, the coming of democracy and the new imperialism, exemplified by the scramble for Africa. As Western nations became more democratic with the eventual extension of suffrage to the whole adult population, so the racial view of the working class, which had dominated 19th century elite consciousness slowly faded from public view. It didn't disappear, it was um, uh, more dinner table talk than, than uh, public speeches. The widening of suffrage coincided with the expansion of imperialist rule in a frenzy of land grabbing by European nations and America too, from Africa to the Pacific. In the coincidence of democracy and imperialism, racial thinking evolved from being an elite ideology to becoming part of popular culture. It also evolved because the language of race became refocused most exclusively on skin colour. Whiteness was extended to all classes 
and most Europeans. That we still view race in this fashion today should not blind us to the fact that it has not always been so, and that our perceptions of race is a product of social negotiation and conflict, and that 19th century um, notions of race are very different from our contemporary notions of, of what a race and what racial differences are. If much of the history of race has been forgotten, so too has much of the history of the challenge to racism and to racial categories. Until relatively recently, radicals challenging inequality and oppression did so in the name not of particular identities, but of the universalism that fueled the great radical movements that have shaped the modern world, from anti-colonial struggles to the movements for women's suffrage to battles for gay rights. That universalism was perhaps best expressed in the Haitian Revolution of 1791, which revealed both the necessity for and the shortcomings of the Enlightenment. It was one of the three major revolutions of the 18th century, but one which, when compared to the place that the American and French revolutions occupy in our culture, is barely remembered today. Yet it was through the Haitian Revolution in which the slaves of the French colony of Saint-Domingue dismantled their chains and declared an independent nation eventually that the emancipatory logic of universalism was for the first time seen through to its revolutionary conclusions. The French revolutionaries who overthrew the old regime in 1789 in the name of the rights of man did not apply, refused to apply, those rights to their colonies. Slavery was maintained, as was colonial rule. It was a 12-year revolution that transformed the meaning of universal rights, forcing the French to abolish slavery, first on Saint-Domingue, later throughout its colonies. The interrectionists, in that sense, compelled French revolutionaries to take seriously their own revolutionary ideals. In the debate over the Enlightenment, supporters and critics both presented as a peculiarly European phenomenon. For one, a demonstration of the greatness of Europe. For the other, a reminder that its ideals are tainted by racism and colonialism. Both, it seems to me, miss the importance of the non-European world in shaping many of the ideals we associate now with the Enlightenment. It was through the struggles of those denied equality and liberty by the elites in Europe and America that ideas of universalism were invested with meaning. Early historians of the Haitian Revolution, most notably C.L.R. James in his groundbreaking work, The Black Jacobins, placed much emphasis on the French Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man in shaping the attitudes of slave insurgents. More recent accounts have downplayed that revolutionary ideology, stressing instead factors such as religion and the African cultures from which the slaves have been snatched. The shift reflects in part the accumulation of new research it also reflects the changing relationship of radicals to the Enlightenment. James published the Black Jacobins in 1938 in a period of intense anti-colonial struggles when radicals still looked to the Enlightenment and, and its ideals as the foundation of progressive movements. In the decades that followed, disenchantment with the Enlightenment became more entrenched and a defining feature of many strands of radicalism. One reason was the contradiction between Enlightenment ideals and the reality of racism and colonialism. If Europe was responsible for the subjugation of more than half the world, many asked, what worth could there be in its political and moral ideals? which at best had failed to prevent that subjugation, at worst 
had provided its intellectual grounding. Non-Europeans, the critics argued, had to develop their own ideas, beliefs and values rooted in their own cultures and histories. And these arguments would lay the ground for what we now call the radical politics of identity. From the earliest days of resistance to racism and colonialism, there were movements rooted in a racial or identitarian viewpoint, from the 19th century back to Africa movements, to Garveyism or negritude in the 20th century. The ideas that guided these movements were often deeply reactionary. Marcus Garvey, like many black nationalists, opposed race mixing, believing in cultural and racial purity. And yet the relationship between universalist and identitarian views could be far more complex. Take the case of C.L.R. James, who's one of the towering figures of the 20th century, but who, like the, re that the revolution um, of which he wrote, is all too rarely recognised as such. In the 1930s, James became a leading figure in both the Trotskyist and the Pan-Africanist movements. Now, these may seem to be incompatible ideologies, the one defining social relations primarily through the lens of class, the other defining solidarity in racial terms. James himself was clear where he stood. The race question, he wrote, is subsidiary to the class question in politics, and to think of imperialism in terms of race is disastrous. So why was he drawn to Pan-Africanism? Pan-Africanism in the 1930s stitched together two distinct political outlooks. For the essentialists, there was an unbreakable thread running through the history and needs of the peoples of Africa. For the anti-capitalists, like James, Pan-Africanism only had meaning in the struggles against imperialism, struggles defined by class as much as by race, and which could pit African against African as much as black against white. Over time, the tensions between those two worldviews became increasingly less resolvable. And the kinds of radical internationalism that James had championed has come to be seen as less plausible. That tension between the essentialist and the anti-capitalist or radical viewpoint has always been there. But over time, the one has faded and the other has become dominant. And that, I think, is really what we need to understand. The reasons for, for that is what we need to understand, to understand where, where and how we got to where we are today with our identity politics. Two developments, I think, fueled uh, this, this, this process of the erosion of the influence of radical politics and the rise, the emergence, the dominance of essentialist politics. The first was the emergence of culture rather than race as a lens through which discussions of human differences and similarities became refracted. In the wake of Nazism, the Holocaust, as the kinds of racial ideas that had dominated the pre uh, war world became discredited. So culture became the medium through which to understand human differences. We started talking about ethnic pluralism, multiculturalism, and so on. It was the anthropologists, the German-American anthropologists, Franz Boas, who fashioned a new concept of culture that made this shift possible. And to do so, he drew, to a large degree, on the work of the romantic, the 19th century um, romantic, German romantic philosopher, um, Johann Gottfried Herder. For Herder, every people or nation or folk possessed a unique history, culture and mode of living. To be a member of a folk was to think and act 
in ways given by the folk. It was a notion of culture functionally equivalent to that of race, but in which the essence of a people was rooted in history rather than in biology. Herder was a, a fierce proponent of equality. But his essentialist concept of culture and desire for cultural purity led him to deeply repulsive views. He abhorred migration and mixed marriages, which he believed were strongly detrimental to the uniqueness of a culture. In the post-war world, ideas of human differences were remapped onto the terrain of culture. But also remapped were all the ambiguities and contradictions of Herder's ideas. In a way, Franz Boas and his intellectual descendants helped construct the bridge over which the ghosts of racial thinking were smuggled into the body of cultural pluralism in the post-war world. The emergence of culture as a medium of social discussion meshed with another key post-war development, the growth of what we might call social pessimism. Radical universalism, the kind of universalism that drove uh, C.L.R. James before that, the Chartists before that, the Haitian revolutionaries. Radical universalism was rooted in the belief that it was possible to build movements of solidarity that could overcome the fissures of race and identity, movements that could radically transform society. That belief has ebbed over the past half century. The breakup of the old Keynesian post-war order, um, uh, uh, the creation of what many now call uh, the neoliberal order. In that process, wider social movements and radical struggles have disintegrated. The labour movement and trade unions have become gravely weakened. The left has lost influence. Class politics has broken. The possibilities of social transformation have seemed to fade. And it was out of this that radical identity politics emerged. The struggle for black rights in America, especially the black power movement, was highly influential in shaping new ideas of identity and self-organisation. Like Pan-Africanism in the 1930s, black power in the 1960s stitched together two distinct political outlooks, the essentialist and the anti-capitalist. The radical edge was given by organisations such as the Black Panthers and by individuals such as Angela Davis. The dilemma with which they wrestled was that even though they rooted their worldview in the form of class politics, they also felt that racism ran so deep in American society that the possibilities of black and white solidarity were illusory. And that dilemma only enhanced the other side of 60s black power, the one that is less recognised, it's conservatism. This was expressed in particular through two themes. The first was a view of black people as a self-contained group with its own culture, values and ways of living. In Africa, they speak of negritude, wrote Julius Lester, who was a leading figure, first in the civil rights and then in the black power movements. It is a recognition of all those things that are uniquely ours and which separate us from the white man. According to Lester, the uniqueness of black culture was its emphasis on the nonverbal. It is the experience that counts, not what is said. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument that you can find, it's a, it's a belief you can find in uh, much of the writings uh, of, of um, black power activists in the 1960s. Um, such claims drew not only on Hadarian arguments about culture, but often em em embrace racist tropes about African Americans as nonverbal. The second conservative theme was the celebration of black capitalism. As one delegate wrote of the first Black Power Conference held in Newark, in New Jersey, in 1968, the general consensus of this gathering 
was that we need to transfer the economic power wielded by white men in the black ghettos to black men. Not tear down the ghettos, not provide decent housing and conditions, but ensure that those who controlled and profited from them were black capitalists, not whites. Between the 1930s and the 1960s, anti-capitalism had become weaker and essentialism stronger, a shift that became far more pronounced over the next half century. As hopes for racial ch of social change have eroded, many have been led to cling ever more fiercely to their own identities as political markers. And the more that one hunkers down in one's own box, the more that box becomes the only way through which to perceive the world, the more that one's race or identity looms ever larger in one's consciousness. As the political philosopher Wendy Brown has put it, what we have come to call identity politics is partly dependent on the demise of the critique of capitalism. A tension between the essentialists and the anti-capitalists, or rather the usurpation by essentialists of the space left behind by the erosion of radicalism, can be seen in Black Lives Matter, the most resonant movement challenging racism since the days of black power. For some, the movement represents a critical re re reawakening of anti-racist consciousness and of black self-expression. For others, it's a divisive organisation that betrays the legacy of 1960s civil rights struggle. In fact, what the movement and the debate around gives voice, it seems to me, is a tension that I've been tracing between a desire to push out and create a more universalist perspective and a retreat into more narrow, racialized sense of identity. It shows how the dominance of the politics of identity leads to the betrayal of those most in need of solidarity. We see ourselves as part of the global black family, reads a, a key Black Lives Matter statement of belief. The trouble is, the global black family is a confected unity that serves only to obscure divisions within black communities and makes the creation of solidarity across racial lines more difficult. A good illustration is the it's a, it's, a, it's a sanitation strike in New Orleans in 2020. In May of that year, sanitation workers in the city walked out on strike because of poverty wages, lack of safety equipment during the, the, the pandemic, uh, and um, uh, a refusal by employers to, to recognize unions. Virtually all the workers were black. So were the employers. New Orleans had outsourced sanitation to a black-owned company as part of the city's anti-racist drive. But Black Lives Matter meant something very different, depending on which side of the picket line you stood, which side of the class divide you stood. As one black trade union leader put it, black exploitation does not end because the company is black. The sanitation workers came out on strike three weeks before George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, the murder that energised a, a, a global movement behind the banner of Black Lives Matter. They remained on strike throughout the summer during a swathe of protests that swept both America and the world and brought racism to the forefront of global consciousness. Yet, Despite that year being the year of Black Lives Matter, the sanitation workers were forced back to work by September, having won virtually none of their demands. The black employers won. The black workers lost. It's a reminder that to assume that there is, exists a common set of interests or an identity that binds together black people is to reinforce the power of the black elites and to diminish the voices 
of black workers. It is to conflate the necessity of challenging racism with the building of racial solidarity. Pursuing the second makes achieving the first more difficult. The problem of seeing everything through the lens of racial identity is visible even in the issue that gave rise to Black Lives Matter, the disproportionate killings of African Americans by US police. Black Americans are at least twice as likely to be killed by police as whites. Paradoxically, though, that disparity should not be seen simply in racial terms. Police violence is unsurprisingly correlated with poverty. The poorer a neighbourhood, the greater the risk of an individual being killed by police. More than half of those killed by the police in America are white. Someone poor and white is more likely to be killed by the police or face imprisonment than wealthy African Americans. Now, because of racism, African Americans are disproportionately poor and working class. But that is not an argument to erase the fact that having a white skin does not necessarily provide immunity against police killings, whereas being wealthy may do so even if black. The issue is not simply racism, but the militarised policing of working class areas, both black and white. Similarly, with another explosive issue in America, that of mass incarceration, America locks up more of its citizens than any other nation, and African Americans are, again, disproportionately borne the brunt of that brutality, being five times as likely to be imprisoned as white Americans. And many view mass incarcerations as the new Jim Crow, most notably Michelle Alexander, who adopted that phrase for a title of a book, a highly influential book. And yet, the issue, again, is more complex. At any given level, at any given income level, there is little difference in the incarceration rates of whites and blacks. But there is a huge difference between the incarceration rates at different income levels. The poorer you are, again, um, something that nobody should be surprised at, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be imprisoned, whatever your race. Uh, one study in 2017 noted that a white high school dropout is about 15 times more likely to be imprisoned than a black college graduate. Again, this story is about class and the policing of the poor as much as it is about race. To suggest that is not to deny racism or to fall in the into the trap of class reductionism, as some suggest. It is simply not to wish away the complexities of the world and to wish away those complexities by creating confected unities around racial identities. Without facing up to those complexities, it becomes impossible to fashion a strategy whether to oppose racism or to defend working class interests. The other side of the breakdown of radical universalist tradition and the triumph of essentialist notions of identity is the embrace of white identity. It has become a means of rebranding racism in identitarian terms. The marginalization of the working class over the past half century has been the product largely of economic, social, and political changes, the erosion of trade union power, the transformation of social democratic parties away from traditional working class constituencies, the growth of inequality, the atomization of society, and so on. But the very decline of the economic and political power of the working class has helped obscure the economic and political roots of social problems. And as culture has become the medium through which social issues are refracted, so many within the working class have also come to see their problems in cultural terms. 
they too have turned to the language of identity to express their discontent. Class has come to be seen not as a political, but as a cultural, even racial attribute. Hence the notion of the white working class, in which whiteness seems more important than class. And all this has opened the door to the identity movements of the far right, which link a reactionary politics of identity rooted in hostility to migrants and Muslims, to economic and social policies that once were a staple of the left, support for uh, the welfare state, defense of jobs, opposition to austerity, and so on. The result is a, a new kind of mass politics and the refashioning of the original reactionary politics of identity for a new age. And at the same time, many of the far-right tropes, such as the great replacement, a, a conspiracy theory about the elites replacing indigenous Europeans with immigrants, and call to resist the loss of the European homeland, have become common currency in mainstream conservative discussions. The irony is that many conservatives are fierce critics of identity politics, except when that identity happens to be white. The mainstreaming of identity politics has allowed conservatives to give racism a new legitimacy by normalizing white identity, while at the same time criticizing the very politics they are embracing. So let me sum up here. The concept of race, I'm arguing, emerged as the medium through which could be understood many of the contradictions of modernity. And most importantly, it made sense and provided a justification for the persistence of inequalities and enslavement in societies that had pro proclaimed their fidelity to equality. The most cogent, deep-seated, far-reaching challenge to the concept of race came through the radical universalist tradition. The erosion of that tradition has created a social space that has come to be filled by the politics of identity. We often talk about the particular and the universal, but humans live neither in the particular or the universal. All humans define themselves through their many immediate rooted identities. A woman, an engineer, a Parisian, a Jew, an FC Barcelona fan, and so on. And in terms of more universal aspirations. Those aspirations are formed by the character of politics and of social engagement. Humanity manifests itself in concrete local forms. And these are the starting points of understanding the more abstract concepts of human universality. Equally, it is the more universal sense of being human that gives our local rooted identities context and meaning. What links the local and the global, the particular and the universal, is activity through which humans make and remake their world, through politics and art and social struggles. These allow us to transcend our immediate local identities and to reach out and discover more universal forms of our humanness. Not as abstract beliefs, but as concrete expressions of empathy and solidarity. From the Haitian Revolution to the suffragette movement, from organising rescue of migrants facing disaster at sea to campaigning for Uyghurs in China. Our engagement with the world allows us to move beyond our immediate concerns and to place those concerns in a more expansive, more universal context. The opposite is also true. When politics becomes frayed, and social movements have disintegrated, the link between the local and the global, between the particular and the universal, becomes strained, even broken. And that's really what has happened over the past half century. Race and identitarian politics are both ways of marginalizing the political, of insisting that right 
duties and obligations flow not from one's beliefs and actions, but from one's being. Whether that being is rooted in biology or history, it is a way of wrapping values and worth and ideals around particular identities. Let me finish with, a, with another quote from Franz Fanon. My black skin is not the wrapping of specific values. His solidarity, he wrote, is not with those who shared his identity, but with all those who shared his ideals and, that, and who would defend the rights and dignity of all people. Seems to me that to transcend race, to break the bounds, not just of race, but of identity politics more broadly, requires us to resurrect that sense of radical universalism, not just as an idea, but also as a social movement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of topics, a lot of historical context, and I am afraid a lot of topics that we're not about to, uh, and ready to discuss here because the time we've got time restraints here as well. Um, in a short while, I'll introduce another guest to join us here at the table. But to refer to your uh, 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 to a lecture, um, we had a broad historical vision of the context of race, on the perception of race, and how it's being used now, but. Where do we go with that knowledge? Where do we go from here? Because identity politics have been framed, as you described, in a certain way by, 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 by everybody. Um, what can we do with this knowledge? How can we move on? Well, first, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, first, what the knowledge, the, the knowledge is important because it, we need to know not just where we are, but how we've got to where we are. Yeah. So that history is important. And that history is important in telling us about the relationship between racial ideals and the politics of identity. They're not the same, as some people claim. Yeah, that the but, 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 yeah. but that there is a... There, that there is a um, uh, they draw on a common well of, of, of ideas and, and, and beliefs about, about um, who we are and how we should see ourselves. Um, it's also important because it's important to see um, th there's a huge debate around identity politics and, 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 and much of it in, done in bad faith. Mm. It's important to see it, I think, as a product of what I call social pessimism, of the erosion, the, the, fa the, the breakdown of the old radical universalist traditions. And, and that, that, that is, has a connection with politics as well, because uh, can we say that identity politics are more important in, 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 in the, the common discussions because we lack the bigger idea, the bigger story, the bigger ideal that also politics can support and, and realise as well? We don't have that anymore, so we refer to identity politics. Well, that's, I mean, there are two ways you, you, you can look at that. You say, well, we'll we, we can't have radical politics, therefore we will stick to identity because that's all we have. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm arguing, that's the very argument I'm arguing against because I'm saying if we take that line, we will never be able to challenge racism. I know, but the, the thing is that... So, so the, qu the, qu question, the question is, do you want to challenge racism or not? I think that everybody here at least wants to challenge racism. Exactly. But, so, so but, but the thing is, 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 is that that knowledge, to, is, is that the way to go about it? Because what I didn't exactly hear in your story is intersectionalism. How, how can intersectionalism now can support, um, you know, the new the new discussion about identity as well, without referring, uh, referring into the identity politics? I have no problem with intersectionalism, but intersectionalism is a description, not a prescription. It tells us how the world is. It doesn't tell us about what to do about it. I mean, it tells us what we already know. Well, you described it as well. If, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're against slavery, yeah, you have to be... Uh, or if it's, it's about international solidarity. So intersectionalism and solidarity are inter interlinked in, the, in my perception. 
Well, no, because, it, because solidarity requires us to move from the local to, 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 to the global, from, from the particular to the universal. Why? Because, we because can, on a local scale, you can be intersectionalist and so have solidarity as well. Why should that... Uh, but but when you say global? you can be intersectionalist, what you're, what you're saying is that we can recognise that we have, there are many different kinds of oppression, that we have different kinds of identities, that we face oppression from different, uh, in different contexts. That's fine, but that's not the same as saying this is what we're going to do about my it. This is why intersectionalism is different because my perception is your oppression is part of my oppression as well. And if I want to fight my form of oppression, I have to be aware of your oppression and fight that as well in order to, to, to gain a more democratic and more equal society. Yeah, that's solidarity. It's, exactly. Mean, so that, that, then that's not that, that's not how most how I understand intersectionality. How how um, I think most, it, it, it is used in most, in, in most ways. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is not to say that um, this is a, a, a means of building um, uh, links um, uh, that can create solidarity in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a in a broader fashion. Mm. Uh, it, that, just, just on that, it seems to me that, the, that what we're talking about when we talk about solidarity, yeah. we're talking about two different things. There are two different kinds of social affiliations, if you like. One which is um, what I might call the, 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 the inward-looking binding politics of identity, which, which says um, what, what defines who I am and who I should affiliate with, what my, what my identity is, um, are, um, are, are kind of narrow questions of... of, of um, it can be uh, race, gender, sex, um, uh, sexuality, nation, um, because mm. um, you know, kind of right-wing arguments about um, the nation are, are as much identity politics as, as anything else, even though they would pretend it isn't. And then there are broader um, bridging for, uh, po po politics of solidarity, which says what matters is not who you are, not your identity, but what you believe in. I've got two things about that, yeah. <laughs> because I think my, my statement is all politics are identity politics because you look for the common denominator in a group and then you form a party and that party forms like an alliance with the population. And it's all based on identity politics because that's the common denominator. What would your response be then? I would say that um, if you were to ask me, um, who would I want to represent me in Parliament, say, or, or, or in politics? Do I want someone who is, looks like me, is of my culture, is of my religion, is of my ethnicity? Up until or, now, that is how politics hold, hold, works here. Yeah. Hold, 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 hold or do I want um, someone with whom I have... Uh, uh, with who, whose views I, I agree, whose values I agree with, uh, whose... Uh, uh, vision of the world I agree with, whatever um, their culture, ethnicity, identity, and so on. Then uh, there's, another that, 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 and there's that, another statement I would like to pose, uh, because I think if you look at Dutch politics, at the moment, exactly that is happening with the right populist parties, yeah. that you have people like Baudet, who you've met, yeah. that doesn't really represent the groups that are voting for him, but he, he is somebody they look up to yeah. without even knowing what actually the party program yeah. looks like. And that's a danger in itself, isn't it? That's because a danger of identity politics, is what not, I've been done driving. Not necessarily, because I don't, I don't think that everybody who votes for uh, Baudet, at least in the last elections, voted for him because of his identity or because he fits their identity politics. They voted for him because there was like one theme, like and the anti-corona uh, uh, policy that he had. That is one theme that's interesting. But I think, wouldn't it be even more fair to have somebody that looks like yourself to be representing you within Parliament, in that sense? Uh, I don't care who, who, what the person representing me looks like. I do care what he or she would says about what my problems are, what their problems are, what, what everyone's problems are, and how to go about challenging it. Yeah. My final question before I... Invite, I mean, can, can I, can I just say, on, on that, there is... Today, there, there is an inordinate number... Um, 
not a uh, uh, number of, of people who look like me mm. in the British government. Can I say, I hate absolutely despise what they stand for. Mm -hmm. And I would far rather that there was a cabinet without anybody looking like me, but who had my values, than a cabinet with a lot of people looking like me whose values are completely low. But this, why is it one or the other? Because there can be people that look like you do that have your values as well. And wouldn't that be perfect too? That, that, would, be, that would be fine. But what I'm saying is... is so it's if, not either no, or? No, it, it's, it, it's not either or, except for this, that... Um, whether or not they look like me is contingent. Whether or not they believe like me is what is essential to, 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 to my relationship. I do understand, there. but can't you also understand or even acknowledge that if people look like me, you can expect to have the same experiences within society that no. somebody that doesn't... No. Well, for example, no. if I look... I mean, I mean the, 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 all, all the, the, the people who, who look like me who sit in, in the British cabinet do not have had, haven't had my experience. Okay, okay may, maybe in that case, but if I, if I compare it to myself, I would love to represent somebody, if, if you talk about gender, I would love to represent women and, and how they experience in society and I would love to be the spokesperson, but I know that my life as a man, as a cis male, is not comparable to what a, a woman in this society experiences. So I don't have the audacity to think that I could represent women because I don't share that same experience. I don't look like them, I don't have the same life experience. But so, what how but you what you represent, when you represent something politically, or, 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 or people politically, you're not representing experience. I you exper ex ex experience. Hold on, experience is, is, is important, um, but there is a there, the experience doesn't lead you to a particular political viewpoint. So that um, there are people who have experience as things that you and I have, uh -huh. um, who have very different views about how... Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, while experience may be important, what is crucial... I would far rather somebody represented me in Parliament who had never experienced racism, but who believed, as I do, about how to challenge racism, the need to challenge racism and how to do so, uh -huh. than somebody who has experienced racism and who is completely, who, who, with, with whom I disagree. Again, that. but that's again either or, because it would be perfect. It, it's a final question, because uh, before I invite somebody else at the table as well, it's whether you have a seat at the table or somebody who represents you can also be very condescending, stating, I know what's good for you. I haven't never experienced it myself, but I do know what's good for you. And we have had in recent history numerous of examples of that also in politics, and that doesn't mean that you're being represented in the right way when somebody has I, like this condescending manner of thinking how you, th how you, th how you yeah, feel. I, I, I fully agree with you. That, 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 Thank that, you! That, and this wasn't... That, 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 that doesn't um, uh, challenge the point I was making about who are one to, to represent me. I think that, that, that what you state, I, and I do agree with, it, with that as well, is that somebody who's knowledgeable, who's somebody who's informed, and her, somebody who can represent my case as well. And that's not only connected to by appearances or by ethnicity. I do agree with that. But again, I don't think it's either or. Let's pause for now. <laughs> I'm, and, and I'm not saying it's either or, by the way. No, very good, very good, very good. Um, I'm saying, but I'm saying one is contingent, the other is, 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 is essential. One is, what do you mean by one is contingent? What, what I mean is that if, if, if somebody believes the same as I do, yeah. Yeah, um, it is contingent whether they are, look like me or don't look like of course. me. Yeah. Um, what is not contingent, what, what, what is not negotiable, is what I believe in mm -hmm. and representing my views, my values, my ideals. Yeah. Thank you for now. Uh, our next guest is Kiza Mahadani, and uh, I would like to invite you at the table. A warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for being here, and we invited you because you're an, a prominent voice in the du Dutch political debate, and we've asked you to react to the work of Keenan. And um, you're a writer, you're a political scientist, and uh, you're initiator of the progressive movement in the Netherlands, Progress Progressive Café. Um, and um, you've prepared something that you'd like to share with us. Yes. I would say the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> 
It's good to be, <laughs> thank you, it's good to be in the Bali. Uh, I wrote an essay for my niece who lives in Ireland. She's um, eight years old, and I think the text is for itself self-explanatory. Um, I try to also integrate uh, the work of Kenan Malik in this letter. Her name is uh, Vumilia. Dear Vumilia, the idea to write you this letter was born two years ago. You were six years old and we were playing in your mother's kitchen. As we finished playing, you asked me to hold you and as I held you, I experienced a certain kind of peace and a connection that I have never experienced before. At that point in my life, I was writing a letter to my unborn child. In that letter, I wanted to give them advice on how to relate themselves to their second skin. That second skin for me is the racial identity prescribed by the society that we live in. And I was, as I was holding you tight in my hands, I knew that I shouldn't be focusing on my Im imaginary child. Instead, I should write you a letter about how deep our connection is and invite you on a journey to transcend our prescribed racial identities. So here I am, addressing you these words. You should know of Umilia, reflecting and writing about racial identity is the last thing I would have imagined doing when I was your age. Back in the Ruzizi Valley, in the eastern part of Zaire, I was more interested in metaphysical questions, wondering whether my existence and my experiences were real. What does existing even mean? Is there a higher force or a reason for existence? I ask these questions without ever finding sufficient answers. Years later, your mother and I became refugees. First, we traveled to a neighboring country and then received asylum in the Netherlands. And due to a harsh reality of life, I was obliged to start thinking about racial issues. Confronted with dogmatic and essentialistic ideas about racial identities, I started wondering whether we can imagine and design a future in which we can transcend the so-called racial identities. To illustrate these dogmatic and essentialistic ideas about racial identities, please allow me to share the following remarkable stories with you. The first story takes place in 2015. You were one year old. In the summer of that year, I found myself in a heated radio debate in which a prominent conservative voice claimed that he wanted Europe to remain predominantly white. Why would you say something like that? I asked the conservative thinker during the music break. There is a reason why all Nobel Prize winners are white, the conservative thinker sneered. I was confused that a prominent intellectual in the Dutch public debate would dare to share such vulgar racist comments in the 21st century. Not knowing how to rep reply, I was overtaken by shame. A shame that until this day, I'm not able to describe. The second story took place the same year. I invited prominent members of the Dutch Congolese community to have dinner at my place in Amsterdam. We consumed different Congolese dishes, including makayabu, pondu, and kwanga. It was a special occasion where we were able to celebrate life and share stories. And in the middle of the conversation, a female, a female participant at the dinner said something that I will never forget. She told one of my friends, who was also a participant at the dinner, that he destroyed his blood by receiving children with a white woman. The friend was hurt. That com comment continue hunting him until this day. Yet he could not find immediate solace. No one among us dared to confront the lady, to tell her that her comment 
was actually racist. I am telling you these two stories so that you understand that dogmatic and essentialistic thinking about racial identities come in different forms. The white conservative intellectual believed that he needed to defend the white blood. The black anti-racist friend believed that she needed to protect the black blood. Despite that the, fa the fact that race is a social construct, we live in a world and on a continent where prescribed racial categories are canonized. This is a result of identity politics, according to Kenan Malik, who we have all heard. In his book, Not So Black and White, he demonstrates how both the current anti-racist movement and the alt-right, or whatever I want to name them, nationalists, use the same racial language to legitimize constructed racial identities. Based on the two stories that I shared with you, Vomilia, it is clear that Malik is on the right track. The conservative thinker and the anti-racist friend were both captured by identity politics. While their arguments may differ, they both believe that prescribed racial differences between people should be protected. I want to warn you against and protect you from this racial thinking. In the week that I wrote this letter to you, a scientific study confirmed the idea that the first residents of the Netherlands had a black skin. This shouldn't, of course, be a surprise, given the fact that the first people to migrate to Europe were black, originating from the African continent. Due to the weaker UV light in the north, the African immigrants evolved to a lighter skin color as a result of evolutionary adaptation. I want you to remember that the whole idea that you can categorize people into specific races has no scientific foundation. That's why you should always be critical of people who claim that they want to protect their own race. And as Kellan uh, Malik illustrated in his book, and I quote, intellectuals and elites began dividing the world into distinct races to explain and justify the different treatment of certain people. The ancestors of today African Americans were not enslaved because they were black. They were deemed to be racially distinct as black people to justify their enslavement. The same analysis can be applied to the colonization of the African continent. On day, the day that the Democratic Republic of the Congo gained its independence on June 3, 1960, Emery Patrice Lumumba gave one of the most remarkable iconic speeches in the political history, addressing how the Belgian colonial regime used race to legitimize its brutality, Lumumba used the following words, and I quote, we have experienced forced labor in exchange for pay that did not allow us to, just to satisfy our hunger, to clothe ourselves, to have decent lodgings, or to bring up our children as dearly loved ones. Morning, noon, and night, we were subject uh, subjected, were subjected to jeers, insult, and blows because we were Negroes, end quote. I told you the story of Lumumba during the last Christmas holidays when you and your mother came to visit me. I thought it would be a good idea to introduce you to the African heroes because I know that you don't learn about them at school. When I told you the story of Nelson Mandela on the first day, I remember how happy you were. The, hist uh, the story had a Hollywood plot in which he became victorious. On the second day, when I told you the story about Patrice Lumumba, something changed. I told you about the struggle to give Congolese people independence from their Belgian masters. I told you about his courageous speech. I told you about his ambitious political plans. But I also told you about how Lumumba was assassinated by the Belgian government and the CIA. And I remember how silent you became after listening to Lumumba's story. Eventually, you fell down. Why, why, why? 
He just wanted to help his people. Why did they have to kill him? Were the only words that came out of your mouth. I mumbled something about greed and power, but I did not know how to console you. When I was telling the, you the story about Nelson Mandela and Patrice Lumumba, I used words such as white people and black people. In the way that I told you these stories, the black people were the protagonists who needed to, get, to win against the villains. The villains in this case were white people, and as they are the ones who colonized black people and treated them like subhumans. I told you these stories to prepare you for the harsh reality of life, that someone will, will disrespect and even hurt you, hurt you because of your prescribed racial identity. Yet despite my good intention to tell you this story, I am ashamed and scared. I am ashamed of introducing racial thinking in your life. And I'm scared that you will, not find, you will find it difficult to, to transcend race as a defining category. I write you this letter out of duty and self-interest. As your uncle, I have a duty to prepare you for the harsh reality of life. At the same time, I hope that, I hope that your younger age can help me transcend racial thinking. In other words, I hope that you can help me and the society at large to imagine and tell new stories that will help us transcend race. By understanding how racial identities shape our behavior, I want you to be shielded against um, racial and racist thinking. I want you to fight when you see that you and other are treated differently because of your prescribed racial identity. Writing this letter is my way of fighting. Writing in general is a way of fighting. But beside fighting, Vumilia, I also want you to love yourself. Don't let anyone fool you. When faced with brutal ugliness or racial and racist thinking, please, I want you to remember that your prescribed racial category does not define you. Instead, your existence is a result of deep forces that transcend our imagination. I will always go back to that moment in your mother's kitchen. As I held you, the world stopped for a moment and we became part of a bigger story. Our hearts beat on the same rhythm, we breathed the same air, and there was no racial category that was were accurate enough to define our existence. And as I held you, I reconnected with my younger self, dancing in the Ruzizi Valley and reflecting on the metaphysical questions of life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And Thank you. Quite an emotional story as well. Uh, Kenan, what's, what's your reaction to, to the story? I thought it was a, a great letter. Um, and I hope your, your niece um, takes from it um, what you'd like her to take from it, what, what you've, you've given to us. Um, and in, in, I, I agree with you, you know, this, 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 your, your sentiments about racial categorization and need to, to overcome it. I suppose what I would say only is this, that, um, oh, and Lumumba is, one of, is kind of one of my heroes. So, so, I can imagine. <laughs> I, I think we, we need to, I, I need to throw that in as well. Um, uh, that there is, um, there, there are people who, who are referring the book who's, who, who, who argue Thomas Chatterton Williams, for instance, who, who, in the book, who, who argues that the way to overcome racial categorization is not to see yourself as, as, as belonging to a race. For me, that's a long story, by the way, because um, I grew up in, uh, in, in, in a society where I saw myself as black and other people saw me as black because black was a, was a political uh, category. Political blackness, you yeah. call that in the UK. Indeed, yeah. yeah. 
and, and like you said, race is, 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 is a social construct as yeah. well. So, um, but one one of the arguments that, that Thomas makes um, is that is, is that to overcome racial category, the racial categorization, we, we have to we we we, we reject. Um, the categorization that, into which we've been imposed. I think that's important, but I also think, and I've had this argument with him many times, is that um, it cannot be done at an individual level. Mm. That what we're talking about is a um, social movement. Yeah. And in particular, I don't think, so long as racism exists, we, can, we, we cannot get rid of racial category, and that's categorization. In, uh, in other words, it, it, in a sense, it's, it's, my, it's, it's what I've been try, trying to say, that, that it's not uh, racism that comes from race, it's race that comes from racism. So as so long as racism exists, such racial categorization um, uh, will continue to exist. Can but we it's, overcome it's, racism? Can, sorry? Are there means or ways to overcome racism? Oh, yeah. How? Because um, uh, there are, um, racism is a set of social um, uh, structures uh, and beliefs. And that one challenges racism by building coalitions across races um, that fight, pursues a particular struggle. So um, one of the reasons I think the question of immigration is so important in Europe today. It's because immigration is what is used to um, create racial categories or, 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 to, or, to, or to impose racial categories. It's what is used to, to tell white workers that the problems they face is because of um, the lack of housing, the, the, the lack of wages, it's because of migrants. The way to challenge that is to challenge that very argument and to, ch and to bring together uh, uh, both minority and white workers to challenge um, the problems of uh, poor pay, mm. the problems of um, poor housing, and so on. And that um, the only way that um, migrant workers um, stop being used to lower wages it's by having solidarity with them, create, uh, having, um, um, drawing them into our trade unions mm. in a more broad sense, to, to see their struggles as our struggles in a way that maybe, you Maybe about. to build on this one, uh, because I'm interested in this whole point of race transcendence. Mm. So when I was invited to come to this program, I did not doubt for a moment, although as I write to my niece, like, why should I even be thinking about these kind of issues? There are other issues, but I think we understand that these uh, things about race and class, they are all interconnected. But I, I wonder when we work on that solidarity, you defined uh, racism as structures and beliefs. Uh, I, I ha if we want to dream big, eh? because you asked the most important question, mm. how can I make sure that my, my niece, when she's my age, does not experience racism. How would you, because I'm very interested yeah. in your answer, but how would you answer that yourself? Uh, I don't have the answer. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, um, I was supposed to work on a project asking this very specific question, so that's why I was happy with the book, because it gives the historic foundation on the roots origin of race, because you need to understand where it comes from before you can fight it. But uh, I begin for my answer, and it's the essay that I wrote to my unborn child. I think this is a follow-up, is maybe to get rid of uh, the languages that originate from the Enlightenment thinking themselves, mm -hmm. when, um, which is difficult, but I think they are still, uh, even in our time, uh, many places that we can transcend this whole idea of racism. So I explained when I was playing with my niece, Mm. I was not thinking I'm a, a black uncle, I was just an uncle mm. e experiencing a loving moment. Mm. And in, in art, in friendship, uh, we have all these moments where our race uh, doesn't really matter. But I also agree with the notion that we should not see it as an individual mm. uh, e exercise, because that's a problem with our neoliberal thinking, is that 
when we, f we are faced with this problem, it's you, the individual, who has to fight yeah. racism. So that's why I was wondering how it looks like. How can I imagine a future in which my niece is not, um, yeah, is not treated differently based on how she looks like? Well, again... <laughs> In other words, how would class solidarity make a difference for my unborn child or for my niece? So that, that's for me a very important question. Yeah. There are divisions in society that are important and which we should grasp and, 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 and cling on to and divisions that we should um, get rid of. And what divisions and, and the, and to? Class is, is, is a division that is important because it explains... Um, uh, the social problems that so many people face. Race is a, is, is a, is, is a, is a division that's used to break down um, class solidarity. Uh, sometimes it's used deliberately. Yeah. We're, we're, we're talking about Jim Crow, the, 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 the rise of Jim Crow in, in America where, where questions of uh, racism was, 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 was deliberately introduced to break up class coalitions. Sometimes it happens because racism um, uh, so infects people's minds that they, will re they refuse to so show solidarity with other people um, because they're of the wrong race. So how can you then realise your... It is, oh, in a sense, it is at, in the process of struggles, in the process, you're fighting for um, uh, cr to create a trade union in a, in, in a workplace that's hostile. You are fighting to um, have um, uh, the leaks fixed in the, in the roof in, in, in a block of flags. In, uh, as you fight those struggles, what you, what you have to do is bring together people of, 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 of what are seen as different races in a common struggle which is essentially class-based. We, we say, we, you know, whether you're black or whether you're white, you are, um, you, we face the same problems in relation to the authorities. And that even, sorry, sorry, go, go on. Now, uh, uh, one of the comments that I wrote is that um, experience does not really, uh, you don't want to be represented by experience. So uh, that's a point that I find is really interesting because class is also an based on experience. So maybe to build on, on, up on that, I, I'm a big believer of this radical universalist system that you describe, and I really hope that it inspires us to really think beyond uh, the current liberal order that we have. At the same time, I see a danger in this whole notion of solidarity. We just discussed mm -hmm. the concept of political blackness. Mm -hmm. You can organize based on specific experiences, but that does not mean that within those specific groups, you have, for instance, racist ideas or yeah. homophobic ideas yeah. or uh, bigotry. So uh, solidarity as a framework is very important. And I would personally speak of essential uh, strategic essentialism, because I think that's... What do you a, mean by that? Now, I think um, uh, Malik made a very crit critique of this essentialistic movement, um, but sometimes I feel that people organize themselves based on shared experiences. Mm -hmm. Like in the Netherlands, people say, we are alochton, we face these experiences, but for this very specific moment, we have one goal, mm. but it doesn't mean that within those groups you have differences. And yeah. uh, you can have anti-black racism, for instance, within a class-based movement. Um, so I think that's also the danger of, of, of solidarity, mm -hmm. is that, yeah, it, um, it can hinder us to see the, the differences uh, within the within group. I, I would like, in a moment, I would like to open it up for the audience to, to if they have any questions. Uh, was there anything you would like to finish off with because you gave your answer only part partially? Sure. Just, just on this thing about um, uh, uh, movements based on uh, uh, essential, uh, essentialism or essential characteristics or experiences. They're two different things, um, I think, it's important. But mo most importantly... Um, when, you're, when one's fighting racism, say, one's not fighting in, to defend one's identity. 
to defend one's essential qualities. One's fighting against the, um, the, 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 the fact that you are not treated as if you are part of a, 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 a broader humanity. That's really what we're fighting. In other words, we're fighting against essentialism um, when we're fighting against racism. Um, and that we're fighting against being treated in the way that you talk about um, as an identity. Yeah, that's the politics of yeah. recognition. Yeah. And that's why I do understand the criticism to identity politics, but uh, to be fair, I think that sometimes people just want to fight for their dignity. Yeah. That the fact that I am not accepted as I am oblige me to, uh, to, to, to uh, highlight this very specific part of my, uh, my identity. Yeah. So for some people, they are not even ready to think about class. Eh? It might be true or wrong, but it's based on the experience that one specific part of their existence is highlighted. Or is, or, it, is it used as a reason to, to, to put you back? Or exactly. So, treat as a second so then they are actually claim, fighting for their recognition. So you have to first to be recognized as a human being, as a citizen, before you can actually engage in a, in a dialogue based on class. That's sometimes what I see mm -hmm. um, happens in, within certain groups. But that, 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 I would say, is different from what I'd call identity politics. Let me give my own experience. I was drawn into politics because of my experience of racism. Experience comes in. Yeah. Um, but it was politics that made me see beyond racism as um, the, the kind of all, be all and end all, that made me see uh, that there was a, 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 a broader world out there, that to fight racism required me more than simply to fight racism, yeah. and that it is that broader world, um, that it was a connection to, with that broader world that took me beyond my identity and my experience. But that confirms just the step that Kiza just now described, that you first have to be uh, identified as a person and identified as an equal person in order to take the next step, in order to talk about class. Uh, well, there's not, not so much even to talk about class. Um, the, the point is that, you may, you, all of us are drawn into politics for, because of particular experiences. There's no question about it. The, quest, the, 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 the question then is, do we remain within those, polit the, 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 those experiences and the politics created by those experiences, or do we expand and create a more universal that, That's easier said than done. It's also not fair. Like in my case, I went to Rome to write a report and I uh, experienced a racist uh, uh, treatment with an Uber driver who did not want to take me with other two respondents. Yeah. He saw three black men, he counseled them. So in this case, I am obliged to become a political element, to become a character of my story. But my white friends in that particular experience, also journalists, they will not be obliged to become political um, uh, to become political. So, in a way, you, you, see, uh, you see that these experiences define yeah. why some will take a racial lens, lens, which in itself is, of course, a paradox. We want to get rid of these. We've got to go categories. beyond that, but you use that, the experiences as a means to go beyond Yeah, and that. I, I think that would be a, a um, strategic essentialism, yeah. is that you recognize, yes, I'm way bigger mm. than these prescribed categories, but because the world is still treating me like this, yeah. I am obliged to, we are obliged to organize ourse ourselves yeah. but, but not based just on these you, categories. Not just you, that, that the point is, not just you, people who have your experiences. Just, to, just as, um, it's not just women who are obliged to fight for the right to abortion. That's, That's an allyship and solidarity. Exactly. That's but so it's, it's, it, yes, the, the, the Solidarity, I think allyship and solidarity are actually two different things. But that, that, that's, that's, that's a different I would like to, to, to give the opportunity to the audience to, 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 to ask some questions and maybe we could return to this point as well. It's, a, it's an interesting point that there's a difference between allyship, allyship and solidarity. Let's try to come back to that in a moment. Are there any questions from the audience? I see one hand here. If you just have a moment when we can get the mic to you so everybody at home can listen to what you say as well. Uh, hi. Well, first of all, thank you all for your talk. It's very interesting. Uh, I had one question to Mr. Uh, Malik. Um, 
when you say, well, ex ex effective change means going beyond racism and focusing on class and economy uh, and, and maybe where, who has the power and who hasn't when, when we look at class. Um, so my question, at, at least, do I interpret that why, right, sort of? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so my question is, and maybe I'm going to be corrected because this is the follow-up. Are you essentially saying, stop Black Lives Matter, back to Occupy Wall Street? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. I'm saying that, that, that if we want to fight racism, um, and fighting racism is, is crucially important, then we have to um, recognize that uh, two things. Firstly, fighting racism can only be for as part of a, a much broader struggle. And um, part of what we've been talking about is are the reasons why those broader struggles have, 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 have disappeared. And so we're, we're left um, with uh, uh, fighting uh, or clinging just to our identities and, 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 and the struggles Route around them, and the discussion we were having a lot earlier was, um, if that's only what you've got left, isn't it better than nothing? And my argument is no, because um, what that does is not only does it not fight racism, um, uh, but it entrenches the viewpoints, um, the, the the kinds of um, uh, attitudes and um, social. Uh, connections that makes it much harder to build those broader coalitions that are necessary to fight, fight racism. Um, so the, 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 the debate isn't about should we fight racism, which I think was kind of underlined in, 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 your, in your argument, but how should we fight racism? And part of the problem, as I was raising about, for example, the New, the, the New Orleans sanitation workers' strike, was that in viewing racism in, uh, and the struggle against it in identitarian terms, those who are weakest, um, most vulnerable, are the ones who actually lose out. Uh, and those um, within minority communities um, who actually have the resources um, are the ones who, 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 who um, win. I mean, it's one of those interesting things that, that, that we talk a lot about diversity now. And in many ways, um, we've re-translated equality as diversity. The, the, where we used to talk about equality, now we talk about diversity. And, 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 but diversity and equality are not synonymous. And we can have a diverse society that is deeply unequal, which, which is you know, a kind of society we're, we're moving into. And the people who lose out when we have a, 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 a when we think about diversity and equality as synonymous, are the ones at the bottom, are working class. I mean, sorry, this is this is kind of moving away slightly from what you were saying. But when we talk about class, it's as if it do, class is not part of the minority experience. It is central to the minority experience. That's a problem. People will say race or class. The point is that class is a central aspect of being a minority, of being black, of being Asian, of being um, a, a minority. Um, and it's because minorities are disproportionately um, working class and poor that class matters even more to, 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 to um, minority communities than it does um, uh, to, to white communities. Um, and, but we think about the other way around. That we talk, we think about mi minorities as belonging to classless communities almost, and of, of 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 class as something that that largely. Um, uh, uh, do you agree with that? Because I don't know whether we make that distinction or uh, that separation between class and race, because class and race are connected as well. I mean, uh, it was an interesting the book on one hand on one hand. Um, Maybe it's also a question because I, I sense that you 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 explain how racial thinking based on phenotypes originate from uh, the Enlightenment. At the same time, you also demonstrate that class, uh, that race was not always based on skin color. For me, it only highlights that it's quite uh, arbitrary how we define race. But 
uh, wouldn't necessarily buy the arguments that uh, the origin of race was not based on, um, on the skin color, based on what you describe. But at the same time, it can be quite uh, disappointing when you think now um, I'm not from the low class, I'm upper class, and you are faced with racism. I think there's also an illusion there. That because if you go beyond class or if you, if you yeah, are socially be, a, moving point, upwards. Pointing, especially as you yeah. described, race is about structures and beliefs. So yeah. obviously we shouldn't only be focusing on a class struggle, but apparently also on belief systems, yeah. which is way difficult. That's why I'm a writer and yeah. that's why I tell personal stories. And I think uh, it's important uh, that we don't only change our politics, but also our heart and mind. So those two things, uh, but how do you change? Am I correct system? if you state, uh, if, even if you go beyond class or are socially upward, uh, racism, you still encounter racism in society? Yeah, so in an addition to what Ken and Malik is talking about solidarity, I would build on the same argument and saying it's really about shared experiences. So in a way, we need to find what is our common enemy, what's our common goal, and based on that, we could be able to think, th imagine a different kind of politics. Mm. But I don't buy the argument. We see that with Fukuyama in, in, in the Netherlands, Ewald Engele, there is a tendency to make a distinction between uh, these, um, these um, categories, but in reality, um, that's why I like the idea of intersectionality in reality. Mm. They are, they are all part of the same story. Same, same thing. Um, we're running out of time, I see. Uh, is there another question from the audience? Something that we haven't touched upon. Yeah, that's two questions and then we have to move on. Uh, so my question slash comment is, uh, it's, it's a little complicated. I'm getting a little confused because, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I have lived in a couple of different countries. This is the third country that I'm living in. Uh, and I'm originally from India. Uh, and I've seen, uh, so I do get the point about, about solidarity uh, amongst, you know, different, uh, the, the different communities or, or, or minority uh, groups. But the thing I'm, I'm getting a little confused coming from India as well is that there are systems like racism uh, which are, uh, you know, prevalent in other parts of the world. And, uh, you know, th this picture that we have been talking about is also like a Western picture on, on, um, uh, on, um, on, yeah, I mean, it, racism is the word we are putting on it, but there are similar systems in the rest of the world. And, um, and, and what I'm getting confused is when we talk about class, we have seen in other parts of the world that that's often used um, as an argument uh, against uh, things like affirmative action or um, things to you know work on actually um, to pr provide benefits and help to people from uh, you know marginalized communities, and that also kind of reflects in those uh, sort of uh, immigrant communities or um, uh, in the West as well. So this is, I think, something you said when you were talking talking about you know diverse c communities here in the Netherlands. I've seen that in the U.S. as well, where uh, there can be you know Asians and South Asians and 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 black people who, are, who might have the same experiences, but then there is maybe anti-black sentiments amongst the Asians or the other way around or, you know, things like, or even uh, in, in South Asian communities, uh, anti sort of sentiments within sort of sub communities in that. So I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little, little confused uh, to understand how, like how generalizable uh, are, the, are the ideas that we have been talking about. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Entirely generalizable. You, you, you're entirely right that, um, uh, racism is not a European or American phenomenon. Um, you just look at the treatment of um, uh, black uh, Africans in Tunisia at the moment, uh, black African migrants. Um, um, or you looked, um, if you look, go back 30 years, the way that um, uh, someone like Idi Amin or, 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 or in Kenya treated Asians as, um, um, uh, and so on. So, so um, and, you know, racism in, 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 in India, uh, particularly with respect to Muslims, is, is, is really, really deep. 
So this is not a... I'm, I, I know we, we, we're talking um, for... Because we, we can't expand the, 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 the subject beyond... Um, to kind of keep the subject within bounds um, in relation, about respect in relation to, to Europe and, 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 and America. But it is, this is a, a generalisable issue. On the question of class, um, I think... It is, uh, I think it's undeniable that, 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 we, 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 that we tend to think about minorities as belonging to communities. You know, we talk about the black community, the, 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 the Asian community, the Muslim community, as if these are single communities with a, with a single voice, single set of aspirations, single viewpoint upon the world and so on. Um, and the, 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 the point really is that... Um, we tend to, there's, there's become a view that, that if we talk about class, somehow we are um, being, removing or be, be, being, uh, talking less about race and racism. I say the other way around, for, for, for the reasons I suggested, that class is absolutely central to, if you want to experience, the experience of minorities. Um, particularly in, 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 in the West, because we are disproportionately um, working class and poor. And therefore, to ignore the question of class when we're talking about racism is actually to ignore the, 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 the real problems that, that, um, uh, the, the, the uh, minorities face. At the same time, you made the point that just because you become middle class black, it doesn't mean that you don't... You, you don't uh, suffer from racism. That's true, but it's also untrue in another sense. It is untrue in the sense that I talked about, that if you look at the incarceration rates in, uh, 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 in America, um, black uh, African Americans are disproportionately incarcerated, mm -hmm. but so are wh poor whites, um, working class whites. And that uh, the, um, to see incarceration as a problem of race is to ignore the fact that if you're wealthy and black, middle class and black, you're not likely to be incarcerated, whereas if you're um, uh, working class and white, you are likely to be incarcerated. Yeah, yeah, and, def I, 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 and therefore, I, I, therefore, therefore to, to see it in simply in racial terms... I, 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 I can imagine that because you've researched that, that, that is right. But that doesn't mean if you're middle class and black in America, you don't, you don't encounter racism in other ways. Yeah, I Getting... recognize that point. But I wonder, should you get rid of class? Uh, well, having heard of uh, on your story, uh, well, I think I'd, also I'd, I'd love to get rid of like, class, but then you get rid of capitalism. But yeah, that, exactly that, that's, because that's, that's I mean because that, that's that's really what we're talking about. Because that's that what I thought reading class. your book and uh, to your lecture is that. What I sense, to be honest, within anti-racist movement is that these struggles, uh, we had a feminist march uh, this weekend, and mm -hmm. it was also against capitalism, against racism. Yeah. You see that these fights are deeply aware of how these structures are interconnected. So in a way, uh, when you analyze, you say, actually, it's class. Uh, we need to think of class solidarity. Would we maybe ask a different question, and that is, how should we get rid of class? Would that be a relevant question to achieve your um, envisioned reality? Well, as I said, I mean, if, if you're saying, if it's you get rid of class, if, if you get rid of class, you're saying, how do we get rid of capitalism? That, that, is that, that a question to ask in a way to oh, well, yes, realize I mean, an anti-racist agenda? I, I, I think it is important, because, because as I've said, the, the, the demise of that kind of radical um, uh, wing of, of, of anti-racism um, has, been, has, has created many of the problems we have today. Um, and that if you go back to, to, to the kind of ra what are called radical universalists, who are a very di diverse bunch of people, from, you know, from Frederick Douglass to Sylvia Pankos to C.L.R. James to, um, to James Baldwin, um, that uh, it, is the dem it, it is that demise of radical anti-capitalism. Mm. Uh, you quoted and Wendy Brown as well. To get rid of borders as well, I guess. Yeah. Realise this uh, ideal. 
Is, is that is that is that uh, just not a question? Because, because that, 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 yeah, that, that, I mean, that that's interesting as well. Uh, what I do miss in, in your um, in your in your description is it's very focused on on the United States. But how do you perceive the Afro your European? Identity or mixed identity, because Johnny Pitts wrote a book about that, and 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 the experience that people of color have here in in Europe are fundamentally different than in America. Is that is that a, a beneficial for the for our, our battle against racism or not necessarily? Well, the, the experiences are, are are completely different, um, and the reason I concentrated on America was that we tend to. to um, adopt, even though our experiences are very different, we tend to adopt the political solutions from America. So it, it seemed worthwhile to actually dismantle those in relation to America to show um, why the arguments that we have over here um, uh, are equally wrong. Um, it, it kind of casts a, sh a, a light on this. Um, yes, it, 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 it is important that we recognise the, 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 the character of race and racism in Europe is different from, from, from that in America, um, as are the solutions, um, except in the kind of broader terms of the kinds of solidarity you, you, you need to build in order to challenge um, uh, uh, social injustice at, diff at every level. Well, I just want to give you the opportunity to ask the final question and then we have to finish up again. Um, so, identity politics is used on the left-wing side and on the right-wing side, and its critiques, uh, critiques are also on the left from left-wing people and right-wing people, but in society it seems like there's an idea that uh, identity politics is only used by people from the left, so how come? Yeah, because you, you said that identity politics is, is apply, applicable to white uh, but why discourse as well? More than that, the original politics of identity was race. Mm. Um, so, so that, um, uh, and I think it's important to, to recognise that. Um, we, we, there's a tendency, I think, we have in, in, in political debate of just looking at the thing in itself at the moment and not putting it in context, not, not understanding how we've got to where we are or, or the broader context. Um, um, and one consequence of that is to see identity politics as a left-wing phenomenon and as a recent phenomenon, and not to see um, uh, nationalism as a form of identity politics, not to see um, uh, the fears about immigration as a form of identity politics. That they're kind of seeing something else. And, and, and Part of what I'm trying to do is say they're not something else, they're central, and that is why we should be very wary about going down that same road um, uh, because the, 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 both the roots and the current um, uh, exploitation of identity is deeply reactionary. Um, so, so, so that we should be careful ourselves in fighting, in, in, in fighting that, um, uh, those reaction politics, in adopting or appropriating. Um, those kinds of arguments. Right. Thank you so much. Final point that I, would, I promise to return to is the difference between solidarity and alliances. You wanted to re refer to that as well, right? No, I, I thought it was an interesting point, but I think uh, the book of Malik is really important in um, challenging us to really reimagine re how that radical universalism mm -hmm. can be uh, regained because we ended up with a corrupt form of liberalism in a way. So I think that's an important uh, assignment. At the same time, for me, what, which is in line with my thinking is focusing on shared experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, that can be maybe through solidarity, but at the same time, you need allies, people who don't necessarily have similar experiences, but because you find yourself in spaces mm -hmm. where they understand your reality, uh, that's how you move forward. Yeah. And you, you, you mentioned that there's a difference. What is the difference between solidarity okay. and the, alliances? The, I, th I think the trouble with, 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 the, with the notion of al 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 allyship, as, 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 as we ha see it now, is that it kind of ex it, it accepts the different groups and says, let us ally together. Um, it, whereas, um, for me, to, you know, it's not saying, you are black, you are white, let, 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 let whites be an ally of blacks in, in, in the struggle. 
we're saying this is a common struggle that, 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 that we have. Solidarity mm. is, is breaking down that, that, that barrier which says you are uh, white, but nevertheless you can be an ally to me. Saying, actually, you are, you are my comrade. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's but you don't have the same, same, same experience, so how can you become a comrade if you don't have the same experience? That's why we need allies. All have, everyone has different experiences. I mean, it's, it's, I mean it, we, you don't have to have the experience of, um, of, being, uh, have, of, of suffering from racism to be a, a, a comrade with me fighting racism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's the problem. That, it goes back to the discussion we're having about the importance of experience. Mm -hmm. Experience takes you a bit of the way there. But beyond that, you need to go well beyond experience um, to, to, to uh, politics um, and, and to solidarity in a broader sense. Otherwise, we get stuck in our experiences and in our identities. Final words from me? Yeah, that's clear. I can only subscribe to the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and how we harmoniously we end this night. Um, like I said, there are many topics that we, we discussed and even more topics that we didn't have any time for. I would like to thank you very, very much for your lecture and your explanation. I would like to thank you for your letter and for your, uh, for your stories as well. I think Thank you for visiting us here at Bali and you at home for watching us. We'll hopefully continue this conversation further. Thank you for pushing me. Ah, oh, <laughs> that's, that's the thing I love to do, to push you. <laughs> but uh, I hope to see you next time in another program and let's keep the discussion, uh, pushing, pushing the discussion forward. Thanks so much and see you next time. Bye-bye.